The case of Alyssa Turney is unsolved. It is unsolved. I'm Vinnie Politan. Welcome to Closing Arguments. You know, when you have something like this, where a young woman goes missing, her remains are never found, but charges are brought, but then the verdict is not guilty, the case is still unsolved. That's what happened here. Michael Turney, uh, even though a jury didn't come to this verdict, was determined to be not guilty by the judge, meaning prosecutors did not have the evidence to prove it. This is significant in many ways, right? One, no justice for Alyssa and her sister Sarah and, and everyone else from the family is looking for a sense of, of justice here. It's, there's no answer. Plus, it's significant because at this point now that he's been found not guilty, Michael Turney can say anything. He could, he could stand there on the side of his car and say, yeah, I did it. And he could not be prosecuted because in this country, you can't get tried twice for the same crime. And again, even though the jury didn't make the decision, the judge did based upon the lack of evidence uh, in the judge's eyes from the prosecution in this case. So he can say anything. That is very, very significant because Julie Janae sitting down with Michael Turney now is asking the questions. There are no rules of evidence. There's no limitations. It's just Julia Janae asking this once accused killer questions about his stepdaughter, his family, everything that was happening here, all the questions that you wanted to ask him during the course of the trial. Julia Janae has an opportunity to ask him. And his answers, I mean, he can say anything. It's not a situation where we have hey, this is, person is a suspect, they gotta be careful what they say, they got their lawyer next to them. No, 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 he can say anything. That's why this hour is going to be extremely compelling and informative. Uh, let's begin here, I wanna show you a little piece of, of, of the interview. This is Michael Turney's reaction to this acquittal by the judge because the clip we saw in the courtroom, I don't even know if he knew what was happening at that moment. It wasn't, it wasn't the normal reaction we see when a jury says not guilty because it was, it was a little subtle and under the radar the way the judge was, was rendering his decision. But let's listen. I heard what he said, but my mind didn't accept it. I, if it hadn't been for Olivia, my lawyer holding me, I think I probably would have fell down. It just was, it's not what I expected to hear. You weren't expecting to hear what it? Well, I know what the law is, and I know what my lawyers told me, especially Jamie, which uh, he works so patiently with me because I'm hard-headed, of, you know, what the law meant, and the judge was right on the money, and uh, Olivia presented a great motion and presentation, but it just didn't, it's like everything else right now, even today, it's just not real. It doesn't feel real yet. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I know what I did and I didn't do, and that's one of the things that came through, at least under our laws in Arizona, which were a statutory state. The judge did the proper thing. But I was shaken, <laughs> and these were weak. I just couldn't believe, and I still don't believe it's over with. We're going to show you a lot more of this interview this hour then. After we watch it, we'll bring in our body language expert. But right now, I want to bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae, who's joining us live tonight from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Julia, I am looking so forward to hearing what he has to say in response to your questions. How did all this come about? Like, how is it that he said, okay, yeah, I'll sit down and I'll answer your questions, Julia? Vinny, you never know what you're going to expect or what to expect when a defendant is willing to sit down. This is a former defendant. We always reach out to all parties involved in a case to see if they want the opportunity to speak, to share their side of the story. This is just one day. Just yesterday, Michael Turney was walking out of a jail, walking out of a jail cell. He was processed. It took 24 hours to get him out of jail after that acquittal on Monday. And today, I didn't know if I was going to see signs of him, uh, seeming like he was weak from being behind bars, if he didn't have a communication uh, very flowing in a way that's flowing 
after being behind bars, but he was actually very disarming in the way that he spoke. He cracked a lot of jokes in between the time that we were setting up everything and had some self-deprecating things to say. But ultimately, if you didn't know the backstory, he was very easy to talk to in a room. Now, were there any rules? A lot of times we have these, these cases, you know, the lawyer will step in, you can't talk about this, he's not gonna answer questions about that. Uh, was there, was there any, were there any rules like that, limitations on what you could ask him? No rules, no limitations at all. We would not have provided questions beforehand anyway, but we didn't even get that ask, which a lot of people do. They wanna know exactly what you're going to ask, but he didn't make that requirement. We didn't even get that from him. Uh, he seemed very open to talk about whatever the question was. He had a very quick answer for anything. There really wasn't anything he even seemed to take a lot of time to think about after I asked him those questions. He did have some complaints, so specific complaints and that seemed to be some of the motivation behind him wanting to speak because of what he says he went through for the last three years particularly behind bars take a listen to something that he wanted to make sure was said during this interview the conditions in the jail of course the sheriff's office was using COVID-19 okay and for the excuse of all the lockdowns and what have you but the the precautions that were CDC was recommending were not going on. The sheriff was bringing people right off the street, right into the cells. He didn't do any quarantining in the beginning. Of course, I filed a grievance on that, but that's me. And um, medical care stuff was, uh, let's put it this way, the last excuse they're giving is not enough personnel. So they'd lock us down all day. They would uh, postpone medical care. Uh, it, it, when you put in what they call an H&R, there was no immediate care, okay. Um, the place actually LBJ was filthy. Uh, getting cleaning chemicals was uh, very, very difficult. Uh, the food, homeless get better food than we were getting. The conditions in the sheriff's office were so much lower than what the Arizona State Prison has. It almost puts into what would be called subtle coercion or enticement to leave, to get out of there, take a plea bargain on whatever it was to get out of there. And that's what most of them faced. And this is a man who spent 10 years behind bars in federal prison. So these were some of the complaints that he felt was important to raise. And one of the reasons that he seemed very upbeat about coming and speaking to us, Benny. All right, Julie Janae in Phoenix. Let's go uh, in and watch this interview. Julie Janae one-on-one -on -one with um, Michael Turney, who has now been found not guilty. Your search efforts, what you were doing from 2001 to 2008. Can you talk to me about what that process was like when you were looking for Alyssa, all the things that the jury learned about? Well, to begin with, the first thing we did, of course, was, uh, Sarah and I did this, uh, is we, uh, well, actually, I put the flyer together myself with Alyssa's picture on it. And she put together a website, I think it's called website, <laughs> Arizona Runaways, and then on that, uh, I put my own phone number on there before I started distributing those. those. But that was several days after. But the first thing I did was start calling everybody, and then I started uh, driving around searching for Alyssa. I mean, you know, again, it was it's a panic mode when you're a parent. I don't care what your background is, and so that's what I did. Uh, you know, I did everything I could think of, including, of course. Late at night, uh, that night, calling the uh, Phoenix Police Department and reporting her as an endangered runaway. Especially the note was not Alyssa's life pattern. Did you believe the note when you saw it? You want to be honest? No, I, I, did, I didn't because, it, again, it was her handwriting. She wrote it. Um, I'm a parent as well as the background of the police department. I, it just... It's one of those stages that you think, oh my gosh, I don't know what, you know, I, I missed something. You know, my daughter's running away from me. So, <laughs> sorry. 
Well, the thought that she was probably with somebody that she knew uh, is what went through my mind to begin with. That, uh, and I guess, because I, I didn't really immediately think that harm had come to her yet, okay? Because Alyssa had been talking about running away uh, for a while. So, you know, my objective was to make sure she was safe. When did you start to think she is truly in danger? Well, to me as a parent, knowing Alyssa, I immediately thought she was in danger because I know that how crucial the first 24 to 48 hours are when someone decides to run away or disappear. That is the crucial time when you need to get out and search for those people. You need to use every avenue you have to uh, find them. You thought you got that call uh, from her. What was that moment like thinking she might be on the other end? Well, like you mentioned, I was asleep when the phone rang, and then when I picked it up, I was half awake, I was exhausted. I'd been a week with little or no sleep uh, looking for her and doing what I could do, panning out posters and flyers before the National Center <coughs> came involved in it. So the first thing I thought was, is this real again? You know, is that you, Alyssa? And then I could hear her voice. But the oddity of the call that I questioned was it seemed like she was holding her, you know, the mouthpiece away from her when she was saying some things. But she was definitely agitated at me. I mean, you know. <laughs> so you definitely knew it was her. No oh, question. Oh, yeah, no, I recognize her voice. I've listened to it many, many times. I know all of my children's voices. So you hear that voice, and do you think, okay, at least she's safe? Or are you even more concerned now because of what she sounds well, like? Well, because it was so abrupt, and then she hung up on me. That was my concern. Was she in trouble there? I mean, you know, did she make the call? You know, I mean, she, I mean, she made the call with somebody forcing her to make it or something else, because that's what goes on in the human trafficking world. So you were worried about human trafficking? I've always been worried about human trafficking long before he, when I became a deputy sheriff, that's one of the first things I learned. And it was one of the most disgusting things that Arizona was the corridor for human trafficking. The cameras and the contracts. Can you tell me where you got the the example of that being a parenting strategy uh, to use these things to help protect your children? Well, the contracts you're talking about, I think I got the idea either from St. Joseph's or, um, what's the other one? Because my father went in for a drug rehab, I believe, and when I was talking to them about Arizona's uh, serious problems about uh, runaways and human trafficking, they said when you have a child that's being, um, what's the word? Well, when you're not really rogue, but when they're not being good, is that it, it helps to make a contract out for ADD children. Because Alyssa, as wonderful as she was, you could tell her something, and then 30 minutes later, Alyssa was off having fun. That was Alyssa. The cameras and securities came after at the house we were living, which was rented. Someone had um, burglarized my truck and then they stole my trailer with the girls' go-kart on it. And then we had a man try and break into the house when my two girls were alone. So Alyssa called me first and then I told her we need to call 911. And I'm not really sure if I called it or she did, but when I arrived home, the PPD was there. Okay. Now then I put the cameras up then I put the whole system together. Despite rumors, the recorder wasn't on all the time. And the children were able to be able to shut it off. It was right there if they want to have a private conversation. <laughs> okay, the outside one, but not necessarily the vent one. Is that the one that Alyssa didn't necessarily know about? Oh, no, Alyssa knew about it. Oh, no. She was the oldest child. And what I've always done is my oldest children knew what I was doing. In fact, I believe because of the way you have to do that, and that was an inside camera only, you couldn't use it outside. In a real home, I didn't want to put staples in there and all that stuff because I'd like to get my uh, deposit back, is that she, somebody had to help me get it through the vent. And it always had a red light on it. Both girls knew it was there. And you know, it was, it was to cover the sliding glass door on the back and that carport door entrance.
I can't wait till we bring in Janine Driver, our body language expert, to take a look at this. We've got more of the interview coming up where uh, Julie Jane tries to get him to explain what happened that last day, the day that Alyssa went missing. Plus, coming up next hour. In Artesia, New Mexico, 19-year-old Alexi Treviso went to the hospital complaining of back pain, then went into labor and delivered a baby in the hospital bathroom. The baby was then wrapped in a plastic bag and placed in the trash and was later found dead. Alexi is now charged with murder, and tonight we speak live with her attorney about the autopsy and toxicology results. How big is the baby? It's full term. They were high school sweethearts reunited. Now he's accused of shooting her husband, and she's serving a life sentence. Jennifer Faith pleaded guilty to orchestrating the murder of her husband. Dark eyes is coming toward me. The alleged gunman, a military veteran who suffered a traumatic brain injury. A case of greed and manipulation. The Boyfriend Hitman Murder Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Watch your children. You know, you can't just let them go with anybody. Lord knows Alyssa, she's very friendly to everybody. She'd walk off with anybody. That's why I carried her for longer than most of the kids. I wasn't going to put a leash on her, that's for sure, but, I, you know, or holding her hand because, I mean, she'd just walk away. That's Alyssa. That is Michael Turney. He was accused of murdering his stepdaughter. That's who he's talking about. He was acquitted of that murder by the judge. He's a free man, can say whatever he wants, can't be tried again. He sat down in an exclusive interview with Julia Janae. Let's watch some more. I want to go back to the last time you saw Alyssa. Okay. When you took her out of school, you wanted to talk about the summer and her summer plans. What was her demeanor like? Just walk me through what she was like that day. What was her demeanor like? Well, Melissa looked at me for advice on many things that didn't come out. But she also was rebellious for my rules, which were catered for Alyssa. Okay. She had been grounded at that period of time, and she wanted to go to a party with two of her friends. And I was telling her no. We were discussing going to, uh, I think it's Chris Rittenhauer's uh, graduation. And at that time, I had said, we're not going to do that. And we need to get the rules straight and find out if you're going to spend the summer with your Aunt Lynette. When did things turn into an argument? Uh, the party was part of it. Uh, the other, again, we had the complication that uh, sh she was going to break up with uh, John Lackman. OK? and. She didn't want to confront him. And of course, Alyssa's attitude was um, she was afraid she was going to hurt him, hurt his feelings or whatever it was. And uh, she wanted me to give the necklace back. And I told her, we're not going to do that. Well, she wanted uh, I'll, you to I'll give go the... with you. You're going to give it to him. Uh, you know, I, whether he's, you know, that's beside the point. Right. She was a junior. That was her last day of her junior year, is that right? The day that you took her out early? Yes. And was there a reason to take her out early versus talking to her after the day was over? Yes. Part of it was because she wanted to avoid John Lackman because of her intent to break up with him. And that's what she told me. It was her idea to take her out early more so than it was mine. And uh, again, I've taken my kids out early for various other reasons. <laughs> when did she leave your presence? When, what was the moment that you all felt you needed to cool off, she's upset? Can you walk me through that part of your conversation after her school day? I think we both got frustrated because it got into the argument. Uh, Alyssa, once she got something in her mind, she was really, really eccentric about it, <laughs> stubborn, and she wanted to go to the party. Absolutely, and I told her that's not yet. We, you know, we did the prom thing, but we're not going to do this just yet because you're grounded. You know, you've given out your phone numbers, 
the people from the uh, drive through and Jack in the Box, honey, <laughs> that's too dangerous. Not just for you, but for your sister and me. And Lisa was so, it was almost cute when her, <laughs> she would see the light go on in her head when you told her why. Okay, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, I can only explain it as a parent. I don't know how you, um, if you've ever had children, you look at them and you're trying to explain something to them, you're waiting for a light to come on and say, oh, yeah, I got it now. And you're saying you didn't see that light go off that day? No, we left, and it, it bothers me a lot. We didn't leave. Last time I saw her was not the best condition that you want to remember. But then again, I stopped on the road and did call her back. A little bit after one o'clock, I think it was, and called her back and told her that I apologized, or tried to apologize to Alyssa, and tell her we're gonna, we'll all go to Chris Rittenauer's graduation. Did, Chris was like, almost like a friend of the family. Did you talk to her, or you had to leave her a message? No, I talked to her. Okay. I don't know how long it lasted. It was, it was definitely a bit longer, and I was trying to apologize to her. And never saw her after that? No. Mm -hmm. Do you have any regrets about that day, that moment? Every day. What do you regret the most? I, what did they do? The what if, could have, should have, what I should have done. I'm the parent, and I'm responsible for my children. And the guilt of running my own child away from her own safety is never going to leave me. Uh, if I could go back in time, I wouldn't have been so hard on her. Uh, Although it was necessary, Alyssa did a lot of stuff and very dangerous uh, to her, even to her sister. So the guilt feeling as a parent, of my child running away from me and whatever happened to her, is never going to leave me. Sorry. It was the recording of you talking to Michael Seth and <sighs> the way that you're talking about Alyssa. It's hard to hear. It's hard for me to hear as a journalist knowing that this was a girl who then was never seen again uh, after that call, after many days. What context do you want to provide for what we heard in that recording? I would say that was probably the most horrible conversation I've ever been involved in. And there's no one else to blame but me. It was frustration. Um, it was also on a, a date uh, that's always been bad for me. February 28th, 1993. The day has always been bad. It's when I lost my wife, Alyssa's mother. So those days never were good for me. As I took medication, whatever it took to get calmed down. But that conversation, I don't want to use the word embarrassing. It's, it's just humiliating to me because I was wrong. And there was no, no excuse for it. But I still did it. But all of the tape recording is not there. Can we talk a bit about Sarah and her now quest to get justice for Alyssa? Do you think she gets that from you in seeing you oh, search? Definitely. Her, <laughs> excuse me, her tenaciousness of pursuing what she believes is the way Alyssa, or Sarah is. That's just Sarah. And I believe she got that from me. How hard has this entire ordeal been on your children? It's all been devastating. And the great tragedy in this for me is I lost my family. Not because of what I did, because of what they were told, which were half truths and lies. Yesterday, when you walked out of the Maricopa County Jail, you were asked by one of the reporters if you had anything to do with the disappearance of Alyssa. And you said you wanted to wait until you talked to your attorney to answer that. Are you able to answer that now? Sure. I had nothing whatsoever to do with, with Alyssa if harm came to her. I, I, because I still blame myself because I ran my kid off. Okay, but did I harm her? No, I did not. And where do you think she is now? What's your best guess? I have no idea where she's at. Uh, but with my police background, I've got to assume because of all the publicity from the news media since 2009, which I encouraged constantly, that she must be out of the country. That's what I believe. And again, the other thought goes that she could be dead, but I don't want to, I don't want to stay on that. It goes there no matter who you are. Uh, but so you believe she could be alive? 
I'm going to keep that hope because she's my child and I love her and I'm not going to give up on her ever. Uh, but the human trafficking thing, uh, I mean, we need, I need to put together something because Sarah's not going to work with me. Uh, the experts are a team that's capable of following the trail that would have probably gone through Arizona on human trafficking. Let's see if we can't locate possibly uh, something about something had happened, somebody remembered something about Alyssa or some way, so have some kind of idea about her. A lot of the people who are going to be listening to this interview and hearing your perspective, they're going to have this burning question because of what has been put out about this case, what has uh, been in the case file, if you followed the trial or if you followed Sarah's podcast, and that has to do with these allegations that Alyssa told people that she was being molested, that she was uh, being inappropriately touched by her stepfather. As a parent, you likely know that it's hard for other parents to hear that uh, from a child and you want to believe it. Help people understand your side when you hear that part of this. Again, it has to do with single parenting. It's a, it's a unique experience, no matter whether you're a female or a male. But with Alyssa, as open as Alyssa was, um, I think she probably picked that up when her older brother John uh, was manipulated into trying to use CPS to get what he wanted. Uh, but there was never any molestation of Alyssa. I was very, very cautious of that, and not just because of what I know as a police officer, because trying to teach her modesty was, was a really a task with Alyssa. And our, the boys would always complain because Alyssa was, and I think she enjoyed that part. And when she, after you get through her bath, she liked to streak and buy them down the hallway. <laughs> and Dad, Dad, Alyssa's doing that. <laughs> That's Alyssa. Interesting choice of words there, right? Real cautious to not molest my stepdaughter. I, I, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. That's why we're going to bring in our body language expert. When we come back, Janine Driver joins us to take a look at Michael Turney. Found not guilty by the judge. I started hearing these stories about murder and stuff. I'm about to be the biggest drug dealer that you can become. <laughs> oh my God, are they starting a war with you or what? I'm not gonna lie, it felt good to be a gangster. She just points the gun out of my face. Boom, 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 boom. Just shoots me. We knew that what we were doing had consequences, but we just didn't care. Vice on Court TV, weeknights at 7, 6 central, only on Court TV. Where do you think she is now? What's your best guess? I have no idea where she's at, uh, but with my police background, I've got to assume because of all the publicity from the news media since 2009, which I encouraged constantly, that she must be out of the country. That's what I believe. And again, the other thought goes that she could be dead, but I don't want to, I don't want to stay on that. It goes there no matter who you are. Uh, but. Do you believe she could be alive? I'm going to keep that hope. That's Michael Turney. He's been acquitted of the murder of his stepdaughter, sat down with Julie Janae. We've watched the interview. Now we're going to watch it with body language expert and New York Times best-selling author, Janine Driver. Janine, great to see you tonight. Thank you so much. Um, let's start with what we just saw there. What, what, what do you think about his uh, response there? Listen, uh, we need a one-hour episode for what's happening here. It's, I come to you today with a heavy heart about this. Uh, there are, are a lot of signs of deception here. We have rolling eyes. He's using interesting language. You know, he even says when asked, you know, what would you say to your daughter? I, I, I'm repeating the same message that I've tried to say to it. 
you know, the language he's using, his body language is congruent with someone who has a really big secret. All right, let's get now to the part where Julie Janay asks him the ultimate question. The ultimate question. Let's watch. I had nothing whatsoever to do with with Alyssa if harm came to her. I, I, because I still blame myself because I ran my kid off. Okay, but did I harm her? No, I did not. Anything there? Oh my gosh, well, do you see that the, the um, forehead, his, his vein is like bulging out of his head right there? We saw this with the Menendez brothers back in the day when they took the stand and they were talking about being molested by their father. This is massive stress right here that when we see that bulge happening, he also does this big sigh. He's sighing a lot. Now, number one, sighing sighs contagious, just like yawning. If you're around someone who sighs, you can sigh. But here's the deal. Sighing is a natural reflex. It's, it's a reset of our respiratory system, Vinny, and you at home. And it's a, a release of, of a built up tension. It's like he's deflating this balloon and it's releasing this pressure of his deception that's happening here. So this is high frustration. He sighs quite a bit here. And he also does this stop as he sighs. This is what's called the stop start sentence. I've talked about this before with you, Vinny, and you at home, which is it's like a scar, it's a verbal scar. When you have a scar in your body, there's a cut in your body. And then the, the skin heals on either side and there's a raise and you can see it. That's what's happening here. We're, we're noticing there's this pause, something is being removed from what he's saying to us, which is most likely the truth here. Listen carefully as well to his words, how he is talking and his body language. We see a lot of eye avoidance. See his eyes moving, gathering to, for that information. This is not congruent with him telling the truth. By the way, as we continue to talk, the strongest denial is always a no. Vinny, are you on heroin right now? No. No. No is the strongest denial. Are you cheating on me? No, not absolutely not. Not a long story. He's doing a lot of this long story here. It's called smoke screening. So we're, what we're seeing here is indicative of someone who is not being forthright with us. This eye rolling he does as well in some other previous clips. This is contempt for someone. And uh, it's as if, you know, he has these momentary slips and we're able to spot them. You know, rolling eyes, when someone rolls their eyes, when you see this, it is the curtain closing on their eyes. Honesty. They're blocking from you. They don't want you to know what they're keeping from you. Now, at the heart of the prosecution's case and, and their theory here is that there was some molestation going on, and that is what perhaps led to what happened here. So Julie Janay asked him about um, these accusations. Let's watch. These allegations that Alyssa told people that she was being molested, that she was... Uh, being inappropriately touched by her stepfather. As a parent, you likely know that it's hard for other parents to hear that from a child and you want to believe it. Help people understand your side when you hear that part of this. Again, it has to do with single parenting. It's a, it's a unique experience no matter whether you're a female or a male. But with Alyssa, as open as Alyssa was, um, I think she probably picked that up when her older brother John uh, was manipulated into trying to use CPS to get what he wanted. Uh, but there was never any molestation of Alyssa. I was very, very cautious of that, and not just because of what I know as a police officer, because trying to teach her modesty was, was a really a task with Alyssa. All right, Janine. Okay. There's so a the lot there. For the person, I'm getting emotional here. Now, for the person at home who's watching, when we're asking people questions, one of the things we want to look for, Vinny and you at home, is how long till he denies that he's done it. We have a whole, you know, he's got a TED talk before he actually tells us that he didn't molest, molest his daughter, right? So he's giving us all this, this, it's, it's like, Dick Cheney, Dick Cheney shot, right? This guy that he went hunting with. When he was asked, did you shoot the guy? He said, ultimately, I'm the guy who pulled the trigger that fired the round that hit Harry, right? And it's like, what? Did you shoot him? Yes. That we're looking for quick answers. Anytime there's this long, huge smoke screen, it's massive stress and anxiety. You're avoiding owning whatever just happened. He is giving us a whole lot. And not only that, 
are you kidding me? So we're talking about, are you, did you, you know, she told people that you were molesting her. Well, this is what happens when you're a single parent. What are you talking about? The first thing should be, I'm a single mother. I don't, I don't even think about my kids getting, I'm not like I work every day to make sure my kids aren't getting molested. So here, right here is very incredibly suspicious. And he starts off with the tongue protrusion. And I've got to tell you, I've talked about this before on Fox. I've talked about it on CNN and I'm always made fun of. And, and the bottom line is people can mock me all you want. When you stick your tongue out, I want you to think like a little kid. When we stick our tongue out, this is high stress. This is I'm getting away with something or I just got caught or deep concentration. If you've ever threaded a needle, I want you to think, here's the eye of the needle, Vinny, and you at home. You take the string, you lick the end, and you go like this. Now, my, my millennials tell me when I give this example that you mean when we put on our mascara? And I go, okay, when you put on your mascara and you're in the mirror, you're also going and sticking your tongue out a little bit. So it's either deep concentration, he just got away with something, or he's got this high stress and anxiety, you see it. As a matter of fact, a lot of answers he's giving us, you see that tongue protrusion happen just before. If you look at athletes, they'll do this, baseball players. Why? High stress and anxiety. High this stress. Is a high level I'm pacifier. feeling some stress right now because I want, I want to show you this last clip. Yeah, um, here he is uh, talking about the last day. Julia asked him, how about the day Alyssa went missing? Let's watch. I want to go back to the last time you saw Alyssa. Okay. When you took her out of school, you wanted to talk about the summer and her summer plans. What was her demeanor like? Just walk me through what she was like that day. What was her demeanor like? Well, Alyssa looked to me for advice on many things that didn't come out. But she also was rebellious for my rules which were catered for Alyssa, okay? She had been grounded at that period of time, and she wanted to go to a party with two of her friends, and I was telling her no. We were discussing going to, uh, I think it's Chris Rittenhauer's uh, graduation, and at that time I had said, we're not gonna do that, and we need to get the rules straight and find out if you're going to spend the summer with your Aunt Lynette. And, then again, the constant one was me trying to get Alyssa to get her driver's license because I needed her help. And uh, as it showed, she'd been driving. And basically, the, our general rules that she needed to comply with, uh, not only for herself, but for her sister, who was watching her as a role model. When did things turn into an argument? The party was part of it. Uh, the other, again, we had the complication that uh, she, she was going to break up with uh, John Lackman. Okay, and she didn't want to confront him. Uh, of course, Alyssa's attitude was um, she was afraid she was going to hurt him, hurt his feelings or whatever it was, and uh, she wanted me to give the necklace back. And I told her, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm, I'll go that. with you. You're going to give it to him. Uh, you know, I, whether he's, you know, that's beside the point. And we also discussed about the beautician school. All right, we have one minute. Give me your analysis of what we just watched. I'm going to do this as fast as possible. Right here, you see that forehead throbbing. I was pointing to my head right here, right above his right ear. Accurate indicator of this autonomic arousal that's happening right above his ear, right where that glasses yep. are coming in. So this is high stress. The question is, uh, you know, what was her demeanor like? Very similar questions were asked of Scott Peterson when and when Lacey was pregnant, went missing, and Uranda Vandersleuth when Natalie Holloway went missing. Both those two people answered very similar to what we have Michael Turner answering which is this he's telling us what she was doing we're asking for an emotion how was she feeling the last time you saw them saw her well how was she feeling probably scared to death just before she got killed and so what will often happen when asked an emotional question you'll hear criminals especially murderers they'll say what the person was doing Scott Peterson said how was Lacey when you last saw her um, she was wrapping presents in the living room um, Miranda Vandersloot how was Natalie when you last saw her how was she oh she was walking along the beach they're not talking about their emotional being so this is a hot spot for me training the fbi cia corporate titans on how to detect deception next and training is, me we're out of time and, unfortunately and so a lot happening a lot happening a lot uh thank you so much janine driver yeah. we'll do it again really really soon